Yeah. So, uh, good evening. I'm Karthik. Uh, I would be presenting some, some. I'll be sharing some, some of the details, some, some, some knowledge about uh, recommendation systems, and of course, it would be with TensorFlow. Uh, so, let's just move on. So, about me. So, uh, first, I'll just give you a brief uh, description. So like I said, I'm Karthik. So uh, what do I do? I actually work for SAP Research. So it's, it's right across uh, uh, this building here. Uh, so uh, my day job uh, is mostly, again, on uh, machine learning. So we work quite a lot on uh, TensorFlow. And uh, we build uh, deep learning models, machine learning models, uh, mostly on natural language processing, uh, some uh, big data, some, uh, some uh, numbers as well. So yeah, that's, that's more or less about me. So uh, prior to actually doing this, I was actually a graduate student at NTU. Uh, I graduated with a PhD. Yeah. So, and then now I'm actually working in the industry in Singapore. So yeah, so let's go on, let's move on. So I'll talk about the agenda first. So first uh, we'll get into why recommender systems. Uh, what are the types of recommender systems? And uh, probably we'll build a recommender system ourselves. So, uh, and uh, probably have a hands-on session. Uh, we'll also go through some uh, inference, some training, uh, right on uh, this machine. Uh, hopefully, it should, it should work well. Uh, and uh, in case you missed it, so uh, all the code, uh, all the inference, all the uh, trained models are available on the GitHub repository. So you, you can uh, download it, and you can try it yourself. All right, so uh, before we get into recommender systems and what, it all, what it's all about, uh, I think we should first understand what uh, data analytics, maybe we'll have us just a short data analytics 101 of uh, sorts. So first of all, there are three main, uh, three main branches, which is basically uh, descriptive and the prescriptive and the predict, predict, uh, predictive uh, models. So what descriptive does is that it basically creates a summary of uh, you know, past data. So it, it creates uh, historic data. It uses historic data to uh, understand what historic data is about. And then it just gives you some information about how the history behaved. If you take about prescriptive, so what prescriptive does is it tries to find a good action possible. So given some data, it tries to figure out what is the best action possible uh, with this given data. And finally, the predictive model. So predictive model is mostly on statistical learning. So most of machine learning is under a uh, predictive model as well. So it tries to uh, statistically understand what the data is about, and then uh, it tries to predict the future. So that's what it does uh, in, in terms of uh, predictive modeling. But in terms of prescriptive modeling, what happens is it basically gives a recommendation. And that is what we'll be talking about today. And uh, finally, for descriptive model, of, uh, it basically tries to figure out some aggregate data. It co condenses their data into some, 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 sort of a, uh, some sort of a form. And uh, when do we use uh, descriptive? So probably we'll use descriptive when we want to figure out what it is about, what the data we have. So some, some uh, knowledge about the data we already have. Uh, probably for prescriptive, what we would want to do is we, we want to use it when we want to get some suggestions, some actions, and we want to actually work on that. And when predictive, uh, we want to actually do some prediction, as the name suggests, we want to do some prediction for the future. So maybe if we are talking about stock markets, then we would probably like to see the trend if you want to sell or if you want to buy. So these sort of uh, uh, learning comes under the predictive model. And uh, for example, so if we talk about descriptive model, so correlation is an example. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, an example. Averages are basically descriptive. Uh, and for prescriptive, we have uh, recommender systems. So that straight comes under uh, prescriptive model. And for pi and finally, for predictive model, we have sentiment analysis. That's, well, that's one uh, example there. So yeah, so with that uh, as a precursor, let's move on to recommender system, which comes under the prescriptive model. Uh, so what is a recommender system? So that is the, the, the primary question that we are trying to, first of all, figure out. So if you think about it, a uh, recommender system basically tries to match uh, a particular user to maybe two relevant items. So the challenge here is that it, it's not about understanding uh, what the user wants or things like that. So it's basically trying to you know uh, wow the user with 
maybe historic data, with similar user data. So things like that is what's actually going to uh, be a success for recommended systems. Uh, for instance, I was just talking to a friend here. So he was saying that some of the uh, recommended systems are not as good. Uh, if you see Netflix, for example, uh, you would have watched movies, and it would actually suggest you really interesting series or movies that based on what you've actually watched. So uh, this is a standard, a very uh, simple example for a recommended system. Um, so basically, how does it do that? It basically tries to see your usage history. So maybe I watched uh, Inception yesterday. Probably I could watch Inter Interstellar today. So that's, that's a straightforward recommendation there. And uh, based on people, so maybe my friend uh, you know, uh, who has a very similar interest to me, maybe I watched a machine learning video today. So he also watched probably something like a deep learning video yesterday. So the recommendation system could actually come back and say, hey, why don't you check out this deep learning video that your friend actually watched? So that's another example for how a recommender system could actually help us. So in this case, what happens is I did not expect the recommender system to actually come up with some new recommendation like that I have not even seen before. Probably I'm interested more in machine learning, but not in deep learning. Uh, of course, it, it's a broader scope. Uh, it's, but it's just that deep learning is, is much more the, the, you know, the, the thing right now. Probably I'm more interested in classical techniques. Uh, but this comes back and you know, show, suggests me that deep learning, there's a video on deep learning, why don't you see that? So, and that's a sort of a wow that actually recommender systems are trying to uh, bring forward. Uh, so these are some, you, know, you should definitely find these similar. So one very interesting example is Google Play. So if you actually uh, download games on Google Play, you can actually see that uh, b there is a category which says based on your previous downloads. So that's a very interesting, uh, uh, you know, straightforward uh, example for a recommender system. And of course, Netflix uh, would actually suggest movies based on your watching history, or uh, maybe even people in your household. Uh, things like Google Instant. Again, Google Instant is a very uh, another very interesting example where it, they actually store some data and then they try to predict data, predict your uh, search uh, question based on your previous searches. And Facebook, for example, is doing something like that. So you might have added a friend, and the, that friend might have added a friend who is actually in the circle. So it actually suggests uh, another friend based on your friend's uh, addition. So that's another example. And for Spotify, for example, so if you, watch, if you, if you listen to some genre music, say so uh, I keep listening to rock music all the time, or maybe I like Hans Zimmer, I keep listening to Hans Zimmer's music. Then Spotify comes back and tell me that comes back and tell me that it's actually uh, Hans Zimmer has a new soundtrack. Why don't you listen to it? So that's the sort of uh, a recommendation that I am actually looking for because I might not know uh, that actually Hans Zimmer came up with some new soundtrack or he actually scored a music for a new a new movie. So these are the types of systems that are actually very useful uh, because if you see uh, uh, players like Amazon are actually trying to sell something. So in this case, uh, a recommender system could come forward and tell me that there is something that new that actually I might have ignored or maybe did not even know. Uh, and so another example is Spotify. I might actually want to buy that track. And this way, uh, Spotify actually gets some revenue based on this new recommendation that I did not even know. So that's what a, a holistic, uh, you know, just a view of what a recommender system can do and does. Okay. So how can we go ahead and recommend? So can we just take something? So the first and uh, straightforward approach is content-based recommendation. So content-based recommendation is trying to figure out uh, the data, and it's trying to understand what the data has, and then you know, matches sort of features with this data and another uh, data. So in this case, the content of the item plays a vital part. And uh, your, of course, your profile, some of the text in your profile could actually also play another vital part. Uh, the, in this case, it's purely dependent on the content uh, extraction. So what happens is if you have a bad content analysis, then again, you're screwed. So that's the problem here. Um, moving on, the next type of uh, filtering or next type of recommendation is uh, collaborative filtering. So what collaborative filtering does is it's basically trying to aggregate information. So like I said earlier, uh, I might have a friend, uh, so on Facebook maybe, uh, who might have watched a video. And I, I also might like to watch the video. So Facebook comes back and you know, increases the, you know, the video on top of my filter, sorry, on top of my newsfeed. 
And then what happens here is that it's, it's trying to uh, figure out similar user interests and uh, we know suggest new content based on user interests. So it's, it's trying to figure out the, 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 the recommendations based on user interests, not on the content. So in this case, if uh, Facebook was to suggest something to me in, in, through the content-based recommendation, it would have to go through uh, the entire video content to actually do the suggestion, which is pretty expensive if you think about it. But uh, so that is what happens. The, the, that's a difficulty with content-based recommendation. So if you see, uh, I'm, for text, maybe parsing is easier. But even then, what happens is uh, human beings are, we are actually, we use lingos, we use unnecessary grammar, incorrect grammar. grammar. So what happens is uh, content-based recommendation fails in a lot of cases. And that's when collaborative filtering kind of uh, you know, came into uh, view. And then finally, probably if you'd uh, want to know what is the best approach, then it's a hybrid approach. And this is where uh, Netflix is actually doing a good job. And this is where a lot of companies are actually doing a very nice job. So if you think about it, what uh, Netflix is doing is it's aggregating information from you as well as your, uh, you know, your siblings or your family. And then it is also using the content uh, if you think about it, what uh, it's doing is basically taking the genre of the movie or maybe uh, the series that you're watching, and then it's actually matching those with your history. So it's doing both. It's doing both content-based recommendation as well as uh, collaborative filtering. So in the case where my, may, maybe my wife would have watched some movie, and uh, maybe because I'm also, of course, sharing the Netflix account, then uh, Netflix would come back and say, why don't you also watch this? Because we have separate accounts, probably. So these are things like uh, what happens with Netflix. And uh, even uh, so other uh, players, other large players, are actually going towards a hybrid approach. And uh, that's been shown to be actually, pr that's proven to be one of the best approaches. But more often than not, it might not be a very you know, st starting off, you know, it, it might not be very uh, feasible to actually start off right away with a hybrid approach. So you, we either start with a con uh, collaborative filtering or with content-based recommendation, and then we subsequently, once we keep accumulating data, then we can actually think about moving towards something like a hybrid model. All right. So what is the need for recommendations? So if you think about it, so this is how we are now living. So we have a data that's pervasive. So you think about we have IoT, we have data collected from cars, from IMUs, from every, every, every part of your life. In fact, my phone is recording my walk. You know, it's telling me that you've actually burned so much weight. My Fitbit is telling me that I have, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, I've climbed like 20 stairs today, 20 flights of stairs. So data has become so pervasive. And the, there is an exponential uh, explosion of data right now. So that is one of the biggest problems. So that was one of the problems earlier. But now it has become an inverse problem where we, do, we have too much data and we don't know how to use it. So that is one of the reasons why uh, we need a recommendation system. So if you think about it, uh, we have Amazon. Amazon might have, like say, 100,000 uh, items for a particular category. So how does it actually promote, or how does it actually show up some new uh, data, some new item that could actually be of use to you? So and this is how it does it. It basically tries to figure out what is your interest, uh, how would you purchase, what is your purchase history, your purchase pattern, and then it tries to suggest uh, new items. So there is also some uh, research that's actually going on about the times of your purchase. So things like uh, you know in the evening is the most way most. Uh, susceptible to buy something. Uh, things like uh, afternoons are also apparently good. So these are all uh, ways for uh, understanding how to actually give a recommendation, how to the need for recommendation, and uh, how do we actually solve this problem. OK, so yeah, so this is one of my, uh, yeah, so let's start, talk about content-based filtering. So let's start with uh, so content-based. So we have four movies here. So we have uh, Interstellar, we have Inception, uh, Gravity, and uh, this, that's, uh, I think that's Dark, Dark Knight Rises. So if you think about it, content-based filtering does something similar to this. It basically takes uh, some features, uh, something like uh, it tries to figure out, is it, is it science fiction? So probably the first three would be science fiction, and the last one is not. Uh, is it di directed by Christopher Nolan? Then only Gravity is actually not. 
And so what happens is uh, it tries to figure out this, and it actually has a matrix. Uh, so suppose I had watched Interstellar, and I am actually looking for a recommendation. And I'm actually trying to figure out, say, maybe I'm just browsing through my Netflix to see what are the possible uh, movies that I could watch next. Then what content-based filtering would do is basically go through this matrix. And it would actually figure out the distance, or maybe the, uh, the, the most the likely that I would actually watch a movie. So suppose these, the other three were the only movies in my list, which is highly unlikely. Then what happens is uh, content-based filtering would try to figure out how, how much of a match the other movies are. So in case of Inception, it's almost like a 100% match. So I'm highly likely to watch Inception. Uh, and the, the, the least is Gravity. And the, the second likely is, is Dark Knight Rises. So if you see, the distance is basically a match between what I watched and the content of what I watched and the new content. So this is how it tries to build the data. So the real problem here is that for you to actually figure out these features. So if you do not know or if these features are not apparent, then it might be very difficult to actually do this sort of uh, uh, filtering, this sort of a recommendation. And the, another problem is that, again, similar to classical machine learning techniques, if you choose different features which are not suitable for a particular problem, then you would again come back to the same cycle. So you would actually go back to saying, OK, I am actually choosing the wrong feature. Is it good? Is it bad? So going back to evaluating if this feature is correct. So these are things that content-based filtering has a big problem with. And so let's move on and see how, uh, you know, this is basically trying to figure out how the, okay, the, the potential features uh, so, and then uh, for the items. So uh, yeah. So how does collaborating, uh, collaborative filtering work? So in this case, so the same, let's take the same four movies. But I have four friends. So let's take an example of four friends who are here, Eva, Dom, Coop, and Ryan. So if you know uh, these movies, you might actually understand these character names. Uh, so Eva has actually watched Interstellar, but uh, Eva has not watched Inception and uh, Dark Knight Rises. So the, the question is not, not what, sorry, uh, this is uh, likes. So it's basically trying to figure out that these four are my friends. So uh, if these four like some movie, then how likely is that being a friend of these four people, how likely am I to watch, say, Inception? Or how likely am I to watch Gravity? So that's, that's how collaborative filtering tries to figure that out. So you have a set of friends, and you try to figure out some new data based on what your friends have already uh, liked. So this is some sort of another way of actually doing the same recommendation. But in this case, you, you realize that you, all you need is uh, the, the like, the, and so probably the understanding of how these people actually uh, you know, appreciated some movie, rather than uh, figuring out what are the features that could actually be part of the, the recommendation itself. So one problem, so this is uh, one interesting thing is that you realize that for Facebook, if you actually do a like, so the, the like is actually contributing to something of this one. So what happens is every time your friend actually posts a picture, you're saying like. So basically what Facebook is going back and doing is, OK, you, you've liked this picture, which means that the content of this picture is useful or maybe interesting to you. And Facebook tries to figure out how to you know, give you features or give you new content that is actually very similar to the earlier like that you made. So if you see that there was actually another experiment that one of the guys did. Uh, for 30 days, he liked every single news feature that he started to see on his news feed. And uh, at the end of 30 days, he realized that his, his news feed was total full filth. So it was completely useless. Uh, so if you, that's the reason why actually Facebook tries to ask you to like something. So and that this is exactly the reason. So the more the some uh, you know part of a uh, some news that you're trying to like, uh, Facebook is going to come back and then it's going to give you suggest new features or not suggest new videos uh, that that you might likely watch. And that's also one of their ways to actually get more sponsors and things like that. So so that's how collaborating collaborative filtering works. So it's based on uh, based on users and. The choices made by similar users. So that's the that's the keyword here. It's basically choices made by similar users uh, is what collaborative filtering is trying to do. So, like I said, so what are the challenges here? Uh, the the challenge here is that uh, what if there are no users to start with? So that's one of the primary problems that uh, 
um, that collaborative filtering has. So whenever I start with a system, I might not have enough users to start with. So that's when uh, I cannot actually give some recommendations. So that's the cold start problem. And eventually, some, some way or the other, every company has to go through that, uh, that, that stage. But eventually, you'll get over with it. So initially, there won't be much recommendations. You won't actually, there might be random recommendations. It's, uh, if you worked with deep learning, then what happens, it's, it's like a neural network uh, suggesting random guesses at the first when you're initializing the network. So exactly here, it's the same case. Uh, while you're initializing, you give random suggestions. Over time, what happens is it tries to learn the filtering. It tries to learn uh, how users have actually responded, and it tries to learn the, the recommendation. So another problem is, what if there are no user profiles uh, that actually match man? So in this case, so suppose I have, uh, so I have a very peculiar personality. I try to you know, watch re really interesting things, which none of the users that actually match on my system. So this could be a problem for uh, collaborative filtering. So uh, that's, that's something that is also a problem for most systems. But again, these are all the outliers, uh, which would eventually we, uh, you know, we can actually get over with. And the third problem is, what happens when similar user profiles actually have completely you know, disparate, uh, 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 disparate uh, interests? So suppose my wife and I actually watch movies on the same Netflix account. And what happens is, what if I watch something totally sci-fi, and then she watches totally that's maybe animation, or maybe that's totally uh, you know, mystery, or things like that. So in this case, what happens is Netflix would try to suggest a new movie. But eventually, what will happen is, because the, the, you know, the, the, the data is so confusing, it's going to suggest something in between both of these. So that's when recommendations kind of fail. So, but again, these are all outliers, but these are challenges that every recommendation system would actually have to go through. That's inevitable. And finally, uh, yeah, this is something again. So if I, if I share the same uh, account, then this is uh, another problem. And yeah, the, the, this problem, the, the third problem is actually where uh, if, I have, uh, if I have two similar profiles, uh, but I have completely different interests, then what happens? So although the collaborative filtering is trying to suggest some data based on similar user profiles, but because my interests do not match to that user, uh, the recommendations are going to be totally, totally useless to me. So that's, that's the problem that uh, the third point is actually discussing about. So again, so the potential approach here would be to actually go for a hybrid approach where we just don't depend on a collaborative filtering kind of an approach. But instead, we actually try to build a content-based recommendation, which eventually you know, tops off with the collaborative filtering and then tries to provide a hybrid recommendation system. All right, so let's move on to what we are trying to build. So uh, in our system, so if you had gone through the repository, uh, it's basically uh, we will try to predict the ratings so this is basically a movie lens data set, uh, when uh, movie lens is basically a, a company that was actually aggregating all the ratings. And in this case, we, the, we have close to 1 million uh, user data. So uh, this is for about uh, 6,000 movies, or 6,000 users, and about 3,000 movies. So the ratings for all these are available. Uh, there is also a larger data set, which is 20 million, and even more larger data set, which is also available for us to test. But we will take the, the 1 million data set. And the problem here is to predict the rating given by a user U uh, for a particular item I. Item I here is basically uh, the movie. And we have close to 6,000 uh, uh, 6, users who have rated 3,000 movies on a rating scale of close to 1 to 5. So, and we would probably use an RMSE between the two ratings and the prediction. And uh, we will see how this actually pans out. And uh, we will actually also see how, what are the possible ways to improve this. And then uh, we will take on from there. So this is our base network implementation. Uh, all this is in TensorFlow. So I'll, I'll give a brief introduction to TensorFlow in case uh, you, this is the first time you're uh, hearing about TensorFlow. Uh, but let me first discuss this neural network. Basically, uh, we have a user ID and a user item. So be, uh, both these are over uh, the bottom. And we, have, uh, we get some embeddings for these user IDs and user uh, the item IDs. 
And finally, we actually use these uh, uh, the uh, embeddings to actually calculate the SVD. So every time uh, the, the classical approach uh, for recommendations is basically we, we create a matrix, and then we try to do a decomposition of the matrix. Uh, but that's the classical form. Uh, what happens if we have millions and millions of data? So that's when we actually want to go for something like a distributed, like a, like a TensorFlow-like system. And uh, that's when uh, TensorFlow actually proves to be immensely useful. So first of all, we generate the embeddings for the users and for the items. And subsequently, uh, we use SVD to factorize this data. And since we are dealing with a million, uh, data, you know, a million a data set of one million uh, records, uh, we'll probably use, we'll definitely use TensorFlow. And this loss is uh, then uh, computed. So the loss over there is actually computed and then back propagated to the network. So this is a very simple neural network. Uh, so we'll start this so that it's actually very easy to follow this neural network. And subsequently, we will actually, if possible, build on top of this and then see how to actually deploy this and then get some inference. So first of all, I'll discuss what TensorFlow is. Why do we need TensorFlow? Uh, and then we will go for the live demo. So first of all, uh, for recommendation, we actually go for a factorization. So that's the conventional approach. Uh, but what happens is that with the factorization, we actually do something like an SVD, which is trying to figure out the latent features uh, underlying the, the users and the items. Uh, but what happens to large data sets? So that is when the challenge is. Uh, we cannot do an SVD on a million by million, probably a matrix. So that is one of the reasons why TensorFlow or uh, you know, a, a deep learning neural networks could actually, uh, a toolkit could actually be very useful. Uh, we actually do something for with TensorFlow here. Uh, TensorFlow is basically a general computation framework, but uh, invariably, or more so, it's actually suited towards deep learning sort of a, a, a setup. Uh, it actually makes most tasks simpler. S uh, things like uh, differentiation could actually be, uh, you, could, you, you, could, you could just go through the theory. But in practice, it's actually very well implemented in TensorFlow. And uh, it's actually being, uh, uh, there, is a, there are so many versions almost every six weeks. So it's, it's practically very difficult to actually keep up with the new API changes. And uh, you know, the, the, the approaches, are actually, the, the, the computations are actually getting better uh, every single release. And one of the bi uh, good things is that we have quite a lot of optimizers. So in the case like we have uh, all the SDD, all, all SVDs, all these are implemented uh, natively on TensorFlow. Um, so it's also possible to compute uh, this on cust uh, clusters. So in case you have a, a cluster, we have so probably dis uh, GPUs distributed across different machines. Then TensorFlow is very, very useful even to do that. Uh, probably, the, probably one of the best uh, uh, deep learning toolkits to actually do distributed uh, training on a cluster. Uh, there are some a few more uh, toolkits like deep learning for j which actually do that. But right now, TensorFlow is still uh, maybe at the, at the computational level, uh, TensorFlow does a very good job uh, in doing the distributed training as well. And yeah, of course, it, it allows GPU acceleration. Um, we'll see why it's actually doing this, how it's doing this. Uh, so if you see TensorFlow was released in November 2015, it's been close to a year and maybe three months. Uh, but it's already probably the, the number one uh, deep learning toolkit already. So if, if you think about the number of GitHub uh, contributions, the number of GitHub stars, then uh, uh, TensorFlow is right now at the number one. In terms of computation as well, so the, the, t the TensorFlow team has done a very good job in actually making uh, TensorFlow, the, the, the conversion, everything actually faster than most of the uh, competing deep learning toolkits. Uh, natively, everything is written in C++ and with bindings in Python. But with the latest release, uh, they have some experimental uh, uh, Go and Py uh, Java API. So that could be very useful in case uh, you know, people do not want to switch from Java to Python. Uh, but everything else is written in Python. So still Go and Java APIs are experimental APIs. So we might have to wait for the actual release. Uh, again, yeah, it's of course one of the popular, most popular. If you look at the GitHub stars uh, as of uh, 6.30 today, uh, this was 45,000 stars. So this is, again, uh, the, uh, just three months back, it was about 31,000. So it probably is one of the most popular uh, deep learning toolkits uh, in the market right now. Uh, the good thing is that 
uh, it's, it's an Apache 2.0 license, which means that uh, uh, you know, on a commercial scale, it's actually very, uh, you know, you, we don't have to worry about uh, litigations and things like that, patents and things like that. So yeah, that's uh, there. So uh, you can also train on multiple, G, uh, multiple uh, GPUs distributed on the same machine, or you have multiple machines, then you could do that as well on a network. And of course, uh, there, uh, it's natively can be deployed on uh, Android and iOS. And uh, one of the good things is that uh, the, 12, uh, the, the current version is uh, 0.12.1, which is also what I'm using right now. Uh, but I think version one, release candidate one, is already out. Uh, I presume that uh, it will be released at the TensorFlow Dev Summit next week. So we have to still wait and watch what they're going to be, uh, what they're going to release next week. So uh, it's quite exciting to actually see what they might be doing next week. And uh, there is native GPU acceleration. Uh, of course, there is. Uh, so in case you have to use, you have to use CUDA for all this uh, GPU acceleration, uh, CUDNN as well. If you want better uh, uh, deep learning bindings. Uh, and it actually runs on uh, Windows, so natively on Windows finally. So with the version 12, it runs natively on Windows. And prior to that, it was anyway uh, working on Linux machines. So, so the current version is 0.12, so, but uh, there are some breaking API changes with TensorFlow version 1. So if you're, if you're brand new to TensorFlow, uh, welcome. Uh, I think uh, if you wait for a week, maybe you might actually get into a, a better API sort of a, a approach from next week onwards. But yeah, anyway, it's, it's still a good time to start with TensorFlow. So that's the link for uh, if you are trying to download TensorFlow and uh, uh, compile it from source. So uh, some basics. So what TensorFlow does, how does it work? So TensorFlow is basically a compute graph. So what it tries to do is it uh, tries to uh, create a directed graph and then does computations on the graph. So that's as simple as that. Uh, it's basically used to uh, define machine learning computations. But um, you know, we can use it. It's, it's, it's a general purpose mathematical toolkit, actually, if you think about it. But in, in general, people use it only for machine learning and mostly deep learning purposes. And yeah, of course, it, it uh, natively supports deep learning models. And this is a typical uh, deep learning uh, uh, a compute graph uh, that is actually run on TensorFlow. So yeah, that's a very uh, straightforward uh, uh, image for a, a compute graph uh, on TensorFlow. Uh, if you think about how it actually manages to do this uh, device agnostic computation, uh, all the devices for the TensorFlow, uh, the, the TensorFlow core engine actually run, uh, sits right on top of the devices. So in, if you actually want to compute certain things, you can actually just uh, add those uh, ops onto a particular device and then do it. So one of the, in one of the talks, Jeff Dean actually says that you could actually do the computation on probably a mobile device if, you can, if it has the compute. And then something else more powerful could actually be done on a GPU. So things like that. So the device agnostic computation is one of the powerful features with TensorFlow. Uh, and that's actually very, very interesting. And uh, right now, there are Python and C++ front ends with experimental Go and Java uh, APIs that are also there for the front end. So okay, uh, let's go to the the live the let's just try out a neural network and then see uh, how it actually does that. So um, the first thing is uh, all the code is actually available on uh, uh, on GitHub. So what I will do is I will basically. I'll keep this mic up, sorry. So, okay. So, um, so in, in the repository, so you'll actually go through, you'll have a, a train rec rexis. So this is the recommendation systems that uh, is actually present on in the repository. So let me just zoom this in. Yeah, I think that's good. So first of all, uh, we'll use uh, the movie lens data set. So like I said earlier, uh, there are ratings for approximately 3,900 movies, 3902 to be a proc correct. 
there are about 6040 uh, user ra uh, reviews, so user ratings. And it was, of course, uh, delivered, it was actually given by uh, the Movie Lens uh, Corporation, or who, who are that? does not matter. It's only the data set that matters anyway. And you can actually get the data set right from this link here. So let's go through this code. Uh, I think it might be useful in case you have some issues, we can actually go through this together. Uh, I'll just go through and I'll just run this right in front here. Hopefully it should all work fine. So the first three imports are basically uh, data I.O. operations. Uh, we are trying to get some DQ, some uh, next is basically for iterations. And uh, we are actually having a readers, which is also doing some data processing. It's basically uh, reading from uh, the uh, TSV, that's a tab separated file. And then it's basically uh, converting that to a data frame and a pandas data frame. And yeah, this worked. The next thing is we are actually uh, having a random seed. So we do this random seed uh, to actually do replicate the experiments again and again to get the same result. So we actually set it to 42. So, or some number, as long, you just keep it a constant. So this will ensure that every single time you run the experiment, you should most probably likely get the same results because every time there's a random initialization, so in, instead of you actually do the seed, you give the seed, so it actually uses the same seed as the initialization. So this way you can actually avoid, uh, or rather uh, ensure that you can replicate the results again and again every single time you run. So the first uh, uh, parameter that we are uh, setting is the unum and the inum. So here is, like I said earlier, so this is probably for, this is the, the uh, number of users and the number of uh, 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 items that we have. And uh, we actually set it to a batch size of 1,000. So I'll talk about what batch size is doing and uh, the dimensions and the max epochs later down. Uh, first of all, I'll talk about the, 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 the data. So Let's run through this, and the meanwhile, yeah. So here, it's basically getting the ratings.dat. So the ratings is basically of the format, uh, like I sh shown here, which is basically user ID, item ID, and then uh, the rating itself, and the timestamp. So what we are trying to do here is that we are trying to get this file. We are loading this entire file. And then we are splitting this file uh, in terms of user, in terms of uh, ID and in terms of ratings. So every ID is mapped to a user, every ID is mapped to a rating, every ID is mapped to a movie. Yeah, that's correct. So now what happens, uh, then next thing is we are trying to uh, uh, split the data into uh, train and the test. Uh, in this case, what ha uh, we are uh, setting some, getting some indices, some random index, and then getting the, setting the data to 90% uh, for training and 10% for testing, so or validation. Um, and this actually result, it gives back the, the train and the test. And here is the actual uh, the neural network. So let me go through this part first. Okay, so the, this is what I'm talking about. So here, if you see uh, with tf.device, uh, so I'm actually placing all these computes on a particular device. And here, it, because my Mac does not have a GPU, I'm actually placing it on a CPU. But if you have GPU, you could actually effectively run some computations on the GPU. And in this case, we are actually initializing some variables. Uh, TensorFlow actually uh, uses weights as variables so, so that we can actually save it for later use. And uh, we, uh, we have some, like I said in the show, uh, like I uh, shared in the neural network earlier, we have a weight for uh, the user item and the, I, uh, and the, sorry, the user uh, ID and the item ID. And then we have some biases for those. And subsequently, we actually use an SVD regularization. First of all, uh, we compute the embedding for the users and embedding for the items. And then we use those uh, embeddings together to actually compute the SVD. Uh, so that's what happens here. So first of all, we have the, the global bias, uh, some uh, user bias, and the item bias. And subsequently, uh, we are actually uh, having an embedding lookup. Uh, that's what is going to give, uh, get us the, the embeddings for the particular uh, users and, per, and the, and the uh, items. And finally, uh, we are going to use those to actually do the, the inference. So the inference is basically just uh, 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 the, embedded, uh, the embedding of the users and the, uh, and the uh, items. And then we are going to compute that and uh, reduce the sum and then get some inference. It's basically uh, an L2 regularization for that, uh, the MacMull. And then we are computing some loss 
based on this operation. And finally, we actually use, in this case, we use a, an, um, yeah, let me run this as well. We use the cost here. The cost is basically an L2, L2 loss and the penalty, and we actually use a follow the regularized leader uh, optimizer, which is actually good in this case. We could use some other optimizer as well, but this works best. So you could try different optimizers here. Uh, so this is, uh, so we basically, if you see, uh, what TensorFlow is doing is it's basically uh, setting up the entire compute, the, uh, setting up the entire model. Uh, till now, it has not done anything with respect to the data. It is basically just initialized everything, and it is setting up for the final compute. So that is when happens, that's what happens in the, uh, in the cell after this one. So let me just go through, where is my mouse? Yeah, okay. So here, this is where I'm actually getting the data. So all along, I've just been uh, running and getting some, uh, all of the, the, the variables initialized, things like the neural network initialized, but I've, okay, so something is gone. Okay, batch size is not defined. So this is it, okay. So it's debug time. <laughs> so usually this should happen. So it is good that. Mm, this is not defined. Okay, no problem. We can just initialize it here. Yeah. So. That's what, uh, so basically some, something was not initialized, so that's okay. So the good thing with IPython is that it allows you to keep uh, Python running in the back and then do things in between while it throws an error and then you can still go back and fix it. So that's the beauty of IPython. That's one of the things I love about IPython. Uh, so in this case, uh, we've, you can see that there are actually in total one million, data, one million uh, records, uh, but in this case we've only used 900,000 of that for the training itself and uh, 100,000 for testing or validation. And uh, the samples per batch is what uh, we might be uh, wondering what this is. So uh, every time uh, we take a small batch and then we train the neural network, uh, in this case, we do that based on the batch size. Uh, in this, and uh, for every time there is an iteration, we actually take only uh, 900 samples. And let's go through what the data is itself. So if you think, if you see what the DF train is, it's basically a pandas frame. It's a data frame. Uh, so we can actually uh, refer to it by the user. Uh, and the head is basically going to take the first five uh, records. And if you see, it's actually by index. And this, these are user IDs. Um, and so that's the train and the test. So if you go down further, you can actually see the, the top five for the, uh, the item. So the item, of course, it's over here. So I'm just running it so that I can initialize all the data again. So all of these are our type in 32. By default, uh, we actually initialize things in float. But to keep things, uh, you know, to reduce memory footprint, we can actually keep things to in 32 here. Um, and this is the item. So all these are, again, integers. So it's mapped to the ID back. And finally is the, the rating. So the rating is also for those particular IDs, for that particular movie. And for that particular, that, uh, the movie rate, the rating was done by that particular uh, user. So here we have some ratings. So again, all these are top five. And finally, we do the, uh, the these are all the, uh, again, we have something. OK, let me go up and then initialize this again. All right, OK. OK. Oops. OK, that's good, I think, yeah. OK, so it initialized. So in this case, uh, what we've done is we've, uh, we've, we create a placeholder. So in general, when you, uh, so TensorFlow would actually, for you to run, uh, throw some data at runtime, you create a placeholder for you to feed the batches of uh, the data. So here we have a user batch, an item batch, and uh, a rate batch. So all these are from the, the data that we actually read from the ratings file. Uh, and then we actually create, uh, you know, these are the first part is a shuffle iterator. So every time the training happens, 
we want the data to be random so that the neural network does not try to you know uh, memorize the neural uh, the data itself so uh, we try to shuffle the data while training and while testing we want uh, data per uh, you know like in a sequence so we actually go for uh, an epoch iterator and then we get the data from the data frame um, so we have the placeholder ready so and the uh, model also ready so this is initialized so up until now, even now, we've not done anything. So TensorFlow is basically just sitting there. Uh, it has created the compute graph. It has basically initialized, not even initialized all the variables. It has created uh, locations for it to actually for, do the initialization. So when you actually go for the next cell, here you see that there is a saver. So first saver is basically for you to save the variables to a local file. So in case you want to maybe restore the variables, if you want to retrain again, or if you want to do something like fine tuning or transfer learning, or something like if you want to uh, you know, start, you know, run it for some time and then come back and do it for some more time. So things like that can be used with a saver. So the saver is basically just uh, like a pickle in Python. So it's, it's going to save all the variables to a local file. Um, and then uh, it allows you to restore it and then train again or do the inference. So this is uh, the first line here. The second line is basically the glo glo uh, global variable initializer. Uh, what global variable initializer does is it that, like, like I said earlier, all the variables that we've created now would be initialized the first time here when we run this. And once this is done, uh, we actually create a session. So a session is where everything runs in TensorFlow. So we actually use a width block here because it's easier to actually maintain with a width block. Otherwise, you'll have to. It's like a. It's like a data. It's like a file open or a file close. You have to op, once you open it, you have to close it. If you don't close it, uh, things like runoff conditions and all those will be there. Memory leakage. So th we actually have a, a with block here, and we in the with block we are actually create using the default session to uh, create an initialization. So first, the first line we do here is is basically the initialization. So let me run this while I talk. It will actually do the training. So what it's doing now is it's basically uh, initializing it and uh, getting the uh, it, it's getting the data per batch. So every time it gets a new uh, for while training, every time it's it's getting a batch, it's actually uh, training, uh, it's actually random randomly uh, shuffling the data and then it's actually uh, feeding it into the neural network. Uh, so the session dot run, the ses dot run here is what is actually uh, feeding the data. And if you see the feed dic, it's basically the uh, dictionary that is actually fed at runtime. And every time, it's basically the user batch. So these are the placeholders. If you think, if you if you saw, these are the placeholders here that were actually fed into the neural network. So these are what are actually being again used to actually uh, initial uh, that is uh, iterate and get the weights. Um, so here, the feed dic is basically getting the user batch and the items and the rates. And it's uh, pr predicting some errors and all the losses, and it's getting the results here. So once you do that, you're actually get, uh, computing the error, and then you're uh, saying what the error is. If you if you go down here, so every time, so an epoch uh, is that is where uh, the neural network has seen the entire data once. Uh, so that's one epoch. If I've seen, so in this case, we have 900,000 samples. So one epoch is actually uh, the neural network seeing all the data once. Uh, and we are actually running it, I think, for 50 iterations here, 50 epochs. So I should have completed by now. Yeah, it has completed it. So let's go through what it has done. Uh, what it has done here is basically every time that uh, it completes an epoch, it is going to do an evaluation of the loss. It's basically the error that in, in actually predicting the data and in the, the error in the, the actual data. So that's how it computes the loss. So the loss, uh, the train error is the date is, is the uh, error with the training data itself. So it's basically trying to compute the error against itself. So that's the training error. The validation error is what the data it's never seen. So data that we actually split 90-10. It's using the uh, that data to actually compute the validation loss. And uh, if you see, it's actually pretty fast. So on this Mac, it's actually taking less than two seconds per epoch, which is for 100,000 uh, rows of data. Uh, so, so what we do is we keep running this, and once we have, so, so in this case, if you go through it, after some time, it actually kind of uh, plateaus. So uh, the error does not go beyond 862. So that is when 
uh, we actually want to see what is happening. So the training loss is actually kind of going down, but the validation loss has plateaued. So if you, let's go down and see the, the validation error here. So if you see the training error is actually uh, still going down. So if I maybe run this for another maybe 100 epochs or so, it might even go down further. But the validation error might not go down. So this is, uh, this is where we need to understand how to improve the neural network, uh, what is possibly maybe data is not sufficient, uh, do we need to add a regular reserve, or things like that. We need to actually understand that, and uh, we have to incorporate those. But for uh, our demo here, we will actually stop over here. And we will try to do some inference with this data. Um, OK, so I think I did not include the data here. I'll run the train data here, OK. So in this case, so we, here we have the, the inference also. I think I've, I've, uh, I've submitted this as well. So let me stop this. and. Let me run through this. So uh, while it's running, I'll just go through all this again. So uh, we, what we've done here is basically the same thing. Uh, so extra, the only thing extra here is the inference. Uh, in effect, what we would do is we would do all the training on a GPU cluster so that we actually do the training faster. And the inference would maybe be on a, even on a CPU. That doesn't matter. Uh, so here, we have yet to start the training. Oh, we have already started the training. So it's, it's already at, uh, at nine epochs. So let it run. So uh, in, in, in general, we would try to do the training on a GPU cluster, like I said. Uh, but in this case, I am still running this on a CPU. But most problems are not so simple. We, we might not have a, a straightforward uh, user item and the recommendation. Uh, in this case, what this will try to do is, given a user and an item, it will try to predict the rating. So that's what we are trying to predict here. Uh, the validation error is the error in doing the prediction uh, for a given a user and an item. So that's what the validation error is here. So it, it's still going on. So it takes about, OK, I think it's done. OK, so uh, let me talk about this. So wh what happens is that after 25 iterations, I think I just ran this for 25 iterations for the test. Uh, it saves the model. So like I said, the saver is actually doing uh, all the, it's actually saving the entire session variables uh, into the model here. So if I go to the model here, it should be under save. So here you have a checkpoint. You have models data and model index and model meta. Uh, if you would want, if you have large training, uh, then what you would do is you basically throw up, uh, uh, you will actually uh, run a tensor board and then uh, see the validation and the training loss. But since we've already done with this, we are already uh, computed the loss and we are more or less done with this. Uh, we are actually going to see the inference here. So the inference here is basically uh, for the batch, and I'm actually showing only the first 10 items uh, because the batch is 100,000 items. Uh, so if you see the prediction is actually very close. Uh, this is based on purely on only 25, 25 epochs. Uh, just on 25 epochs, this could actually do uh, quite well. So if you see, given a user and uh, an item, uh, we can actually predict quite close to the actual uh, result. If you see, the, there is a prediction, is the actual is 5, and the prediction is uh, 4.9 already. So that's the sort of, uh, uh, you know, the, the level of uh, data, that is the level of training that we can do in short, such a, a short span. So we have a good compute. So, so TensorFlow allows you to do you know, feed in batch by batch and get the evaluation done uh, straightforward. But what if I do have a very poor or a very old laptop or things like I want to actually do compute uh, on the cloud? So think, that's when we actually go for uh, Google Cloud. And uh, that's, we, will, we will go back to that. So what happens with Google Cloud is that uh, we can actually uh, set up a, so I think when you start with, you get $300 as credit. Uh, and the cloud infrastructure is pretty good. You, it allows you to do uh, distributed training. Um, we can actually uh, do the same thing. We can do the training locally. And we can set up uh, the entire cloud uh, using a storage and everything uh, on Google Cloud ML. Uh, we basically uh, you know, fire up the console. Once we do that, we actually uh, enable, we have to enable building. 
So initially, don't worry. It's, it's only for three months, and uh, you have $300 to uh, test all the models and things like that. It's actually quite fun to understand what Google Cloud is actually uh, can do and what it cannot do. So at times, it's a bit difficult to actually uh, set the data and then do the computations. And at times, it's slower than uh, the CPU that you have. But uh, uh, still, if you think about it, if you have uh, some cloud infrastructure that you would like to get some inference on the cloud, then this is a good way to go. Uh, so once you actually have a trained model like we have right now, we can actually uh, put the model on Google Cloud and then set that. Uh, so let me just show how that looks. So it actually has a cloud. Uh, let me show you that case. This is where uh, your cloud, uh, so the, the minute you actually finish your training, so this is the place where you, I think uh, the TF model is not visible. OK, so once I finish training, I actually come here and then I, I put the data over here. I put the saved model over here. Let me go to the console. Uh, let me fire up the console also. So this is the console. It's typically. Uh, an Ubuntu console, and uh, it tries to fig uh, get the uh, connection first. Uh, yeah, and then it has a, a very similar shell that you would like to. S so if you see, it's this, and then if I actually do an LS, I have uh, all this uh, data over here. So once you uh, set up the storage, uh, you actually go here, and then you uh, put all the data on this place here. So you create a bucket. And then uh, once you have a bucket, you actually put all the data, the physical data that you want into the bucket. And uh, from you can actually use the same uh, data, that you, same uh, TensorFlow code that you ran locally to actually run on the cloud. And you can get the inference from that itself. So let me just see how that looks. So yeah. So in this case, uh, we have uh, the same data over here. And we can also, so the, there is a capability with uh, uh, Google Cloud is that you can actually run TensorBoard as well. Uh, and then you can run a Jupyter Notebook. So all that is also possible with the, the Google Cloud on, the, on this infrastructure. Uh, but currently, I, I'm not able to run the ML because of some billing issues. But otherwise, you can basically put all the data. Uh, and uh, all, uh, you can actually do the same inference that we did with the TensorBoard or the, the Jupyter Notebook here. Uh, on Google Cloud. So we can get the same results, and we can actually uh, wrap it on a JSON, and then we can actually put it and uh, get the results. Uh, you can actually do of, uh, you know, get the res response uh, from Google Cloud. So that's, uh, so in instead of actually taking, you know, figuring out how to uh, set up a complete server by yourself, uh, you know, Google Cloud can actually allow you to uh, do that part. And you, all you have to do is train this locally and uh, put it up there. So yeah, so that's, the part here. Yeah, let me try to figure this out. If I'm able to set this up, then maybe I will uh, let you know. But if you have any questions, uh, you can ask me. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'll try to set this up. And then, uh, so yeah, so once you uh, finished with the, uh, the model, you actually choose the create version. And then the version actually allows you to uh, uh, you know, seamlessly move from one version to another without actually having a downtime. So it's something similar to the servables. Uh, in TensorFlow, and then it actually creates uh, different versions. You can actually uh, provide different versions to different people. And then the uh, Python API allows you to actually uh, poll a different uh, version and then get the results from different versions. So basically, I can have the same uh, algorithm, but doing different jobs uh, for different people or different uh, API calls. So all that is actually possible So with the versioning. And uh, yeah, so that's more or less uh, my talk. So, if you have any questions, uh, you can you can ask me. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can, you can come to the uh, question, Mike.
Hello. Hi. Hi. Yes, thank you for sharing. This is one question on the um, back to code, okay. okay, the Jupyter notebook. Uh, this is a uh, method uh, using SVD. Can, it, can you ex uh, explain a little bit more uh, about that method? Because to me, it's like a matrix uh, multiplication and uh, some uh, addition, right? So what do you call it, SVD? So SVD is basically a uh, single value decomposition. So uh, what we are doing here is basically a, a type of SVD here. So we are trying to get uh, the u, v, uh, u, sigma, v kind of a, a decomposition here. And yeah, so it, it's a very simple, it's a very similar way out here, but it's not cal cal calculating the eigenvectors and things like that. Right, I, actually my question is why you have your code, it looks like that you're doing oh. the matrix model. Oh, okay, so this is a very simple implementation. So uh, we want to do the same factorization, but with the user and the item data directly, you're actually getting an inference uh, based on a very simple matrix multiplication. If you're going to do uh, an SVD itself, it might be too computationally expensive. So instead, we actually resort to a, simple, a simpler way of computing the same factorization. So you're getting uh, vectors from the getting uh, Yes. And you just multiply them. Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, one question is, um, uh, this is done via TensorFlow, but there are some other alternatives, for example, in Apache uh, Spark. Mm -hmm. So do you, did you do any comparison on performance? So, um, oh, okay, so this is, uh, so of course we can do it with Spark, but the point is, uh, this is not a, comp uh, it's not a comparison between uh, TensorFlow and Spark. So Spark is, is a purely a distributed computing net, uh, framework, right? So, but with TensorFlow, the availability of uh, various tools, you know, something like uh, where you want to do uh, optim different optimizers, uh, if you want to go deeper. So one thing that is actually interesting is if I have a deep neural network, so it's a, I, this is basically a simple embedding and uh, computing the loss, right? So what if I want, if, so like I said, the plateau, the loss actually goes to uh, 0 0.86. But if you have a, 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 you know, more parameters, if you can actually uh, get deeper, if you can uh, get, have a deeper neural network, then you can actually go, you can actually get better features and you can get better results. So the point is that you, you can actually do more computations. Uh, so with Python, with the Spark, it might be possible, but uh, TensorFlow is actually good with, in terms of the computation. So the reason for doing TensorFlow is, is there is no, I don't think there's a comparison between TensorFlow and Spark because these are completely different. Uh, I understand, okay, yeah. I understand. My question is, do you try to build the model using different tools and see whether uh, which model works better in terms, in terms of the IMSE? Okay, so yeah, of course, if you, if you have a, uh, no, I didn't do the, com uh, the comparison there, but if you have a, a deeper neural network, it should definitely perform better. So yeah, to answer your question, no, there is no comparison there, but this is to, uh, to introduce how to actually do a recommendation system, to build a recommendation system in a very a straightforward way with TensorFlow. Okay, another question I have is, uh, you mentioned the hybrid solution. Did you try that with the, I mean, movie lens is just uh, the ratings. There is no content there. Yes. Is there, do you try any um, have a solution? For so this kind of with this data problem? set, it might not be possible, but with other data sets, we could do that. So, uh, so for, for example, uh, if we have something like a Netflix data, so the Netflix challenge, then maybe we could actually do more, but for a content-based, what we might have to do is uh, include the word embeddings as well. So things like, uh, you know, the similarity between the genre maybe, or things like uh, other, other features might be used. But in this case, this is a very straightforward approach for, uh, this is a very, uh, for the collaborative filtering. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Hi. I have a very oh. connected, similar question. No. Uh, it was about uh, the different models and when do you use which one. Mm -hmm. So in the, this particular example, where would you use a conventional collaboration model and where would you think a deep learning would be more useful on top of like, would it depend on the data, number of features, where, how, and why? Okay. Maybe that's useful. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So the, the question is, uh, when do you use which model? And uh, so to answer that question, um, so it depends. So the computation is, is what is more important. 
So if we if you want to actually do uh, you know if you have a lo lot of data, then typically you can use a deep neural network. Uh, but if you have very very small data, so probably I have only you know thousand records, then what will happen is uh, a deep neural network might overfit. Or uh, so what hap So in general, you try to generate more data. So when you have lots of data, say a million records, like I said, like I showed here in, as in the movie Lens data set, uh, you can actually go for something like a neural network. Uh, but classical techniques uh, still work well. Uh, in in most cases, classical techniques are actually good because data is the problem there. So although we are actually we have a lot of data, uh, we still do not have access to those data to actually do the computation. So in those cases, we actually still stick to the classical approaches and then uh, get the results for those. But in general, uh, we can actually do well. So there are actually uh, good papers right now which can act produce uh, data from, so things like uh, uh, generative adversarial networks can actually uh, generate new data based on uh, the earlier data. It's basically like uh, neural, net, neural dialogue generation. So things like I can actually do a Turing test with a computer, and then I could still, you know, the computer could pass to be a human being. So things like that is possible, but it's it's only with uh, data you can actually do such things. But without data, it might not be possible. But if you have data, then uh, so uh, the, you can actually you still have to do uh, an experiment and then see, figure out if you need a deep neural network, if the neural network is good enough. So things like uh, you know going through what is the validation error, if the training error is going down, if it is not going down, maybe run for more further epochs. Uh, then if it is not going down, maybe uh, have a deeper, deeper neural network. So things like that. So will come into play. So yeah. So hope I answered the question. Yeah. Hi, Patrick. Hi. My name is uh, Shantanu. I'll be saying for question. Um, I understand that TensorFlow provides you with a large number of optimizers built into the language itself. Uh, is it possible for someone to extend and implement their own version of a new optimizer in TensorFlow? If yes, then because of distributed computing for the underlying runtime, do you need to go into C++ or do you need to do more complex stuff or is it possible to do with Python itself? Uh, so if to, okay, so the question is, uh, is it easy to build an optimizer yourself, or things like something fundamental, some fundamental operation yourself? So to answer that, yes, uh, it is possible, uh, and yeah, it is. All, all these are C++ bindings. So if you want a basic operation, things like C++ would still be the only way to go. But you can still write in Python. The problem would be that uh, it might not be as efficient as the underlying uh, implementation. So suppose I implement, uh, you know, SGD again. Uh, thinking uh, it might have a better, uh, uh, improved approach to doing the same, uh, say maybe an Adam optimizer, then what will happen is that the underlying the uh, uh, code would still perform better in terms of computation, in terms of uh, efficiency. Still, that would still be better because it's an open open source implementation and it's been continuously implemented. So yes, to answer your question, yes. Uh, you will have to do it in C++. So it's up to you. To, if you can do it in Python, if you're OK with the overhead. Uh, hi. Hi. <coughs> hi, maybe I'm just wondering, uh, because I think when we see the code, it seems like a kind of a black box, you know, for a new programmer like myself. So is it possible for us to even go down deeper to see how the algorithm works? How does it come up with the training? What are the computations that went through? Yes. And finally, how to test, how to know, maybe you could demo some of that would be helpful. Yes, it is, it is possible. So that is one of the, that is one of the topics that, uh, so, in order to understand what a neural network is doing, so uh, we typically try to see the activations. So we actually go, uh, once we have the trained model, we, uh, so to actually go down deeper into what it's doing, we actually see the activations itself. But uh, uh, so for a programmer to come up with, uh, to understand what it's doing, it's better you actually have the underlying machine learning knowledge. So all, although, so everybody, all, all of us here would have been a programmer once. So it's, it's nothing to, uh, you know, you can always start. And uh, it's, uh, it's better to understand what the neural network is doing before getting into it, because uh, after you get into it without understanding it, you might not think, you, know, you might not understand what a hyperparameter is doing, what a stride is, what a kernel is. So things like that uh, would become completely, uh, you know, too, too many things to understand. So things like dropout would become too confusing. So if you don't understand the underlying concept. 
So if you're starting from scratch, I think it's, it's still, uh, you know, there are so much to actually happening and a lot of uh, resources available. Uh, you can still go deeper and then you can understand it. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a problem at all. So uh, what approach for you uh, say is good for if I want a manual tweak, say there's a seasonal recommendation I want to add in, which I know is not part of my data. Mm -hmm. Say in Christmas I want to recommend a movie to, mm -hmm. to a lot of users. So is, is this something that can be done within the model or will you recommend something? So in the, in the uh, movies uh, data set, so there is a timestamp. So what you're asking for is basically using the timestamp to actually improve the recommendation, right? Uh, no, uh, a manual uh, recommendation kind of, I know that it's a Christmas and I know that in Christmas season, a lot of people see these movies. Mm -hmm. I want to put that in, in my recommendations. Okay. But I know my data doesn't cover it. Okay, so in that case, then you might still have to, you know, uh, retrain the data. So, or you, because your under your data has only seen that the training that it is it was given. So, if you w have something completely new, then it might actually recommend something completely unrelated. So, to answer your question, we might have you might have to retrain the data completely again. Would you recommend doing something outside the model, uh, say ensemble, or or if I don't have data to train it, or would you recommend? Generating data somehow. Yes, so for somehow is a very difficult. So with images, it's actually possible. Uh, with Im there is a there is this paper called generative adversarial networks that can actually generate. Uh, so they've shown that it ca they can actually generate new images that's actually completely indistinguishable or to an extent indistinguishable to even human beings uh, about the original data. Uh, but for text. There is a new paper uh, from Stanford, the NLP group in Stanford, that actually generates dialogues. That's a neural dialogue generation using reinforcement learning. So the, the GANs is actually a very interesting topic. So if you want to generate discrete data yourself, uh, so at the moment, uh, it has been actually kind of solved with, uh, with neural dialogue generation. But with discrete data, like uh, something like maybe stocks or things like, in your case, uh, weather data, which is not available, it, it is still a problem. It, it's not uh, directly, you cannot generate data in that sense. Hi, Shantik. I'm Sean. Which is your favorite, cheapest airline ticket recommendation system? Thanks. OK. so. I don't understand. So the cheapest airline recommendation, if you still, I think one of the good things is, uh, hmm, I don't know, there are too many. Uh, if, if, when I want to book a ticket, I generally don't stick to one. Uh, I would generally have a, a, an alert on Google Flights, on Kayak, so many things, so on Skyscanner. But in general, I found Google Flights to be good. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we can take questions on you in 30, 10 more minutes, so more questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, have a simple, sorry, sorry. I have a simple question about uh, linear regression. Mm -hmm. Have you actually tried to implement a linear regression? And uh, uh, most of the time, we have to give how many degrees or how many uh, coefficients are there. Is it possible to actually let the algorithm define how many uh, coefficients and how many degrees it, it, it has to be uh, rather than we give it ourselves. Yeah, so uh, so things like that. Uh, so it, that's the con that's the sta classic problem of uh, if you have, say, a two-dimensional data and if you're trying to do a linear regression, if I have, say, uh, if I fit three points, if I, uh, uh, sorry, if I fit three coefficients for a linear data, then typically I would be overfitting. So what you're talking about is basically finding the hyperparameters. So there is, there is a standard way of doing that. So there's a Bayesian method, which actually tries to do uh, a brute force. There is a brute force, of course, that's straightforward. But if you, if you have very, very high dimensions, 
then it might be very difficult to figure out uh, with a conventional or a brute force approach. It might be computationally too expensive, and the time taken would be is too expensive. But it's possible. Yes, there are approximate methods to actually figure out the hyperparameters. In what you're talking about is basically the number of coefficients, for example. But there are other uh, parameters as well. Uh, for example, the batch size, maybe, uh, or in, in for instance, learning rate or the momentum, things like that can also be learned. So it, for all those hyperparameters uh, can be figured out that there are algorithms that allow us to do that. Is there any recommendation of the algorithm so that we can just check it out? Sure. Uh, I, can, I can maybe uh, share that uh, offline. Yeah. Hi, Hi. Thanks for sharing. Uh, just a question. You mentioned that uh, uh, you can use uh, TensorFlow to train a hybrid implementation model, right? So, wondering whether you have some uh, implementations on these uh, use cases and uh, where we can find uh, examples. So, uh, so right off the bat, I don't have an implementation. But if you think about it, so like I said earlier, so content based is uh, is d it depends on the content. So it depends on what sort of content you're looking at. So, for example, if I'm looking at suggesting images. Uh, and you know, uh, having a hybrid of images plus uh, the collaborative filtering, then I'm, I might have to understand what the content of the image is. So that is one of the. So you have to define the problem before you actually get into uh, you know developing a hybrid approach or any sort of approach. First of all, but yes, it is possible. But uh, right now, I do not because it's going to become too uh, computationally expensive to compute on even a laptop or even on a, on a server. Because uh, the, the type of content, the data you have, uh, right now, I don't think I have the data for doing that, but it is possible. Uh, for say, uh, in a uh, recommendation uh, problem where we involve multiple source of data, mm -hmm. uh, of course, in movie lines, there's a single source of data, yeah. like hybrid source of data. So you want to do hybrid recommendation system without involving a manual uh, 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 engineering of the content. So, so uh, it's, it's not manual engineering per se. In that case, so because uh, even in uh, when you're doing a hybrid approach, uh, say suppose I have a movie titles which is actually images, then what I could do is I could train a separate neural network that actually understands the content. So things like I could actually uh, use the inception network to understand what the image content is. So if there is a person in it, I could actually say there are three people in it uh, with a car. Uh, so something things like I could understand the content from the image, and then I could actually club it with you know, have a, a word to work representation to uh, get a new train a neural network on that part for the content, and for the for the collaborative part, I could actually use the user item kind of an approach, and I could combine those to actually uh, still do a recommendation. So it's it's not feature engineering, handcrafted feature engineering in that sense, but you still have to choose one of the sources. So finally, how do you combine these two in a tensor flow? So again, so you need to still train the neural network to do the sort of an inference to sort of understand what the content is. So if you're having an image, for example, then you might still have to understand what the image contains, right? So you, might, you, could, you, you still have to have a trained model on that and a trained model for this and combine these two like a joint training and then still, yes, it is possible. Do you know whether TensorFlow can only support live data streams or whether it's um, just on disk? So by live data streams, you mean images? Uh, live streaming data. Live streaming data in, in the in search of Im data. sorry. So just telemetry data. Okay, so it is possible. Yes. So uh, because all uh, you, you as as long as you're doing it for testing at inference, it is still possible. Because uh, in in the end, uh, what TensorFlow is doing is basically you can initialize the entire uh, graph, and then you uh, it's about how how the latency in the in input and the computation and the output. So if you have uh, something like uh, a trained model, which can do uh, inference within, let's say, uh, if I have a GPU, for example, uh, if I give you an inception model. So for example, if, uh, because in images, what we have is we can actually do it much faster than real time. So if we can, if we can do that with images, then with telemetry data, which is typically uh, you know, a matrix or a, a number, it is definitely possible. Yeah, just yes, it, it's surely possible, yes. Hi. Hi. Um, basically, your data is as good as what you can recommend, but we know that um, recommendation changes over time. Yes. Mean that people um, have different preferences. So, do TensorFlow provide this kind of um, data aging or like discounting of your data? Okay. So, so TensorFlow itself is only a compute engine. 
So it's not about TensorFlow. You can, you can use the same model on any deep network or any uh, tool, mathematical tool to develop the same uh, algorithm or same results, the same model. The point here is, uh, to answer your question, you want to actually include something like a, you know, a decay for the data. Weightage. Yeah, weightage. You could still do that. So what, what we, uh, we basically do is we have something called incremental training. So you actually have a model that you actually keep training over time. The, if you have some new data, you, use the, you initialize the same neural network with the existing, net, uh, existing weights, the weights that you trained earlier, and then you train it with the new data. So what happens is even if your data is not as large as the earlier uh, way you train, you could still train the neural network to actually improve uh, the way in which it's uh, given the new data. So you you um, propose a continuous kind of training? It's incremental training, yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, we'd like to ask how do you finally deploy this uh, TensorFlow model in a Python server like using Flask and create the REST API? Yeah, so uh, effectively, you still have a wrapper, so like Flask. Uh, so every time you, there is a job, so every time uh, you need an inference, uh, you, actually pull, you actually have all these jobs scheduled. And then you actually, uh, once you have the jobs, you actually run these jobs for every single inference. Uh, typically, if it is images, you actually batch all these. And if it is actually, if, if you cannot do a batching, then you still need to uh, have these models uh, initialized on the uh, compute, and then you can you still get the inference uh, based on a schedule uh, that you're actually running. So it's like uh, something like a queue server, so like a rabbit MQ or things like that. So you, you basically uh, uh, give some data that needs to be run on the model, and then you uh, get the inference, and then you store it uh, separately. Sorry, I'm actually, I'm actually quite new to TensorFlow. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask is, if we train a model mm -hmm. based on, uh, based on, uh, we train a model, is it possible to use transfer learning to make another model that is of similar, that has similar features? So, so instead of run, like if I want, for example, movies, so I want to do another model on books. So instead of running the whole data for books again, I use the, uh, the, the model for movies. Okay. So yes, it is possible. Transfer learning is one of the uh, best things with uh, deep learning. So you can actually, so if you see uh, in images, for example, the ILS VRC was close to 1,000 categories and a million images. Uh, it is actually, you can use that to train completely new categories. So for th from 1,000, I can actually do uh, cats versus dogs or things like I can train a, a, a human being versus cars. So things like that can be done with TensorFlow, yes. And in uh, TensorFlow, there is a, a b binary file that allows you to do this retraining. So you could, you could do that, yes. Maybe a last question, anyone? So, uh, Actually, I'm new to TensorFlow and machine learning. I just want to ask that how do you assign the weight? Suppose uh, I got a lot of data from web different websites and I have a lot of data. So the thing is machine learning basically works on the numbers and uh, because you train your models by assigning the weight and numbers. So how you uh, assign a weight and numbers? Like I went to your site, like a Google AI project, there are a lot of projects and then those are projects are working on numbers like uh, musical instruments are there when person just play some piano and some uh, random strings will be played so at there the numbers are mainly uh, they convert they convert all the files in the numbers and then based on that numbers it plays the program so how you uh, so because uh, I, I i can't understand that why how how you are assign the numbers to your this thing yeah. so uh, typically you don't assign the weights so the weights are first, uh, during the first iteration when uh, the, the graph is initialized, uh, it's initialized to random. So if you see the first training error is 2.4647. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, because it's randomly initializing it. So now what happens is from there onwards, uh, every time, so the first time it's because it's random, uh, it produces an output, which is basically an equally probability for all, all the classes. Uh, that is going to predict. So now what happens is it predicts, so once it gets a loss, it back propagates the error, and that's how it actually refines the, the neural network. So the weights are not uh, 
you know, initialized with a particular value, but instead it is randomly initialized. So if you scroll up here, you can actually see that the weights are um, So here, the, the weights are t truncated normal initializer. So if you see over there, uh, let me highlight that. So that so that's the truncated normal initializer. So that's the that's the re that's the way you initialize the weights. So you don't initialize it to a particular value because then uh, it, that completely defeats the purpose. So now uh, once you have this, you actually uh, back, pro back propagate the error, and then over time, if you see the error actually goes down. So that's because the weights are being uh, learned, and it actually produces better results uh, over time. So every epoch, the uh, the loss actually goes down, and effectively it's actually improving the accuracy as well so hopefully yeah that's what is happening over here every time there is a loss reduction so that's the reason for the re reduction in loss as well so this is basically uh, recommendations for the movies yes so uh, my main question is that suppose uh, in a movies you have a list of names mm -hmm. then you have a ratings of the user mm -hmm. so ratings in the numbers the list uh, of the movies is just uh, like uh, the strings so you assign the strings a uh, number, a uh, random number. Mm -hmm. No, no. Here, what happens is this is basically. Uh, so, if you see the the data itself, it's basically mapping the ID with a user and uh, an item and the rating. The item here is a movie, and the user is a particular ID. So, uh, what you're saying is that uh, it, it's not actually uh, taking uh, some random number. It's basically the uh, the rating that the user gave for that particular movie, and what we are doing is we are taking it into uh, making it into two separate data frames, and then uh, having the rating as another data frame, so that we can actually use that uh, as a loss. So when we actually do use these two to actually predict the rating, we actually uh, find the error, and then we propagate that back. That's what we are doing here. So every single time there is a compute, uh, we are actually uh, predicting what the rating would have been given this user, given that particular movie. That's what we are trying to predict here. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, my question is that uh, there's a device called a CPU. Mm -hmm. uh, you are passing this device here and there. Yes. Uh, how will this impact uh, the, the program itself? So, so the good thing with uh, TensorFlow is that when you're doing all this, it's basically like compiling. So in Java, so you ha when you actually do the compilation, it's actually do, uh, going through all the variables and then figuring out if something is wrong. So in this case, it's not figuring out something is wrong. It's basically uh, setting up the compute graph, and then it's only uh, uh, setting itself up for all the data. So effectively, it's not impacting anything, because it's, it is already setting up everything before you even pass it the data. So once you pass it, because it already knows that this is the data that it wants to process, uh, it shouldn't actually matter. So it, uh, because it knows how to actually take it from one device and put it back, so it should not have it should not impact on the performance at all. Uh, and, and it, does it mean that uh, CPU colon zero means one core? You're forcing the program to use yes, one the, one for the first core. Yes. Oh, okay. So if you have multiple cores, you can actually. So if you have multiple GPUs, you can basically uh, make that operation run on a particular GPU. That doesn't need any code change, right? No, no code change. Okay. No code change. So if, again, certain uh, just one caveat here is that certain codes like embedding uh, do not work on GPU. So you still have to do those on CPU. So you, if you go through the API, you can actually figure out what are the uh, computations that can be done on GPU, what are the computations that can be done on CPU. But yes, in general, you can actually, it's device agnostic. So you can, uh, I, because I'm running this on the CPU, if I had a GPU, I could have as well run this on GPU. Yeah. Thank you, thank you everyone. Let's uh, thank Karthik for this session. Okay, um, you know, just before everyone moves off, we just have a very small lucky draw uh, because I have requested some uh, strikes.